Alrighty, new video, new set of notes. So, um, this is Socrates' first speech, the second speech. That, I know, I know, it's, um, but nonetheless, the second speech we'll be taking a look at. Um, it uh, starts boo, 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 on page 16, right after um, the character Socrates covers his head. And he starts out by, um, by, by pointing out a major failing in Lysias' argument, um, right towards the bottom of the page. If you wish to reach a good decision on any topic, my boy, there is only one way to be begin. You must know what the decision is about, or else you're bound to miss your target altogether. Ordinary people cannot see that they do not know uh, the true nature of a particular subject, so they proceed as if they did, and because they do not work out an agreement from the start of the inquiry, they wind up as you would expect, <clears throat> in conflict with themselves and each other. Now, you and I had better not let this ha happen to us, since we criticize it in others, because you and I are about to discuss whether a boy should make friends with a man who loves him rather than one who does not. We should agree on defining what love is and what effects it has. Right? So, the big thing that Lysias failed to do as he laid out his 11 line argument for why it's pre uh, preferable to give your favors to the non-lover rather than the lover, he never defined love. So that's the first thing Socrates is going to do here. Right? He agree. It, 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 he defines love as some kind of desire, right? and I think that's reasonable. I, I love you means you've got some sort of desire, but he points out that um, we, we also know that men not in love have desire for what's beautiful. So how shall we distinguish between a man in love and one who is not? We must realize that each of us is ruled by two principles which we follow wherever they lead. One is our inborn desire for pleasure, and the other is our acquired judgment that pursues what is best. Sometimes the two are in agreement, but there are times when they quarrel inside us, and then sometimes one of them gains control, sometimes the other. Now, when judgment is in control, it leads us by reasoning towards what's best. That sort of self-control is called being in your right mind. But when desire takes command in us and drags us without reasoning towards pleasure, then its command is called outrageousness. And in the footnote, outrageousness, it can be translated as hubris right? or ultimately Madness. Uh -huh. Now, he gives us a few examples of when this happens, when the inborn desire for pleasure overcomes acquired judgment that leads us through reasoning towards what is best. Right? Well, whichever form stands out in um, a particular case gives its name to the person who has it. So he's about to give us a few examples here. And that's not a pretty name to be called, not worth earning at all. If it's desire for food that overpowers a person's reasoning about what is best and suppresses his other desires, it's called gluttony and gives him the name of glutton. While if it's desire for drink that plays the tyrant that and leads the man in that direction, well, we all know what we call them then. And now it should be clear how to describe someone appropriately in these other cases, call the man by that name, sister to these other names, uh, that deserves, uh, uh, sorry, that derives from the sister of these desires that controls uh, uh, him at the time. As for the desire that has led us to say all of this, it should be obvious already, but I suppose things that are said are always better understood than things that are unsaid. Mark this in your book, page 18, um, right by 238C, he defines the kind of love that he's talking about here, which is Eros. Right? I've truncated the, 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 the definition here, when desire for pleasure overcomes our el better elements, right? 
but that's more generally madness, right? Specifically, eros is the unreasoning desire that overpowers a person's considered impulse to do right and is driven to take pleasure in beauty. It's force reinforced by its kindred desires for beauty in human bodies. This desire, all-conquering in its forceful drive, takes its name from the word for force and is called eros. So the unreasoning desire that's to take pleasure in beauty, it's force reinforced by its kindred desire for beauty in human bodies, is all-conquering and is called eros. Right? So by definition, what eros is, is when the desire for beauty in human bodies, right? a form of pleasure taken from is sort of the, 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 your desire for human bodies, right? overcomes your better elements and plays tyrant in you. It's called eros. Right? So what have we learned from this? That love, eros, is a form of hubris, outrageousness, or madness. What Plato through Socrates is going to lay out over the next few pages is a treatment of this form of madness in which it's bad. Therefore, love is bad. Straightforward, I promised you a deductive argument. If love is madness and madness is bad, love can be nothing but bad. Right? It's a deductive argument. And in what follows, you'll find uh, the sort of linguistic literary cues, right? You'll find the word necessary, of necessity, that sort of thing, right? Um, it, 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 it peppered throughout everything that follows, right? Now, it's sort of an interesting argument uh, that, that Plato lays out here. Right um, it, through through Socrates' first speech, um, he basically it lays out uh, three different aspects of the beloved and asks what sort of effect this kind of affection, this kind of love, this kind of overpowering desire for the beauty and the pleasure to be had in a human body, right? will have on the beloved, right? So what are the effects of being in a relationship with somebody who is erotically entangled with you in this kind of way, right? What are the effects on your intellect? What are the effect on, uh, effects on your physical development? And what are the effects on that sort of a weird category, which he calls possessions, but possessions include friendships and that sort of thing, right? And what you will find is that this kind of desire in each and every case, insofar as it overpowers, produces an instinct for the lover to maintain a certain degree of control. Because if love is an inborn desire for pleasure, akin to hunger or thirst, right? well, you want to control the object, and I choose that word very carefully, right? the object of your affections. Right? If I'm craving a hamburger, I'm not going to want that to, re uh, to resist me. If I am craving a, a glass of beer, I'm not going to want that to resist me. So in each and every line of argument that follows here, right, Plato argues that this kind of inborn desire that overpowers our acquired judgment that leads through reasoning towards what, what is best and is obsessively driven to take pleasure in the object of its desire leads necessarily to a situation which is harmful to the beloved. Right? The first line right, of argument you find on page 19. What benefit or harm 
is likely to come from the lover or the non-lover to the boy who gives him favors. It is surely necessary that a man who is ruled by desire and is a slave to pleasure will turn his boy into whatever is most pleasing to himself. Now a sick man takes pleasure in anything that does not resist him, but sees anyone who is equal or superior to him as an enemy. This is why a lover will not willingly put up with a boyfriend who is equal or superior, but is always working to make the boy he loves weaker and inferior to himself. Now the ignorant man is inferior to the wise one, the coward to the brave, the ineffective speaker to the trained orator, the slow-witted to the quick. By necessity, a lover will be delighted to find these mental defects and more, whether acquired or innate, in his boy. And if he does not, he will have to supply them or else lose the pleasure of the moment. The necessary consequence is that he will be jealous and keep the boy away from the, uh, the good company of anyone who would make a better man of him. And that will cause him a great deal of harm, especially if he keeps him away from that which would improve his mind. That is, in fact, divine philosophy, from which it's necessary for a lover to keep his boy a great distance away, out of fear the boy will eventually come to look down on him. He'll have to invent other ways, too, of keeping the boy in total ignorance and so um, in total dependence on himself. <clears throat> that way the boy will give his lover the most pleasure, though the harm to himself will be severe. So it will not be of any use to your into intellectual development to have your mentor um, and companion a man who is in love. Right? You see, it's all about control here. And if we you know, look at past centuries and the way that education was, for example, it afforded to men and expected of men and discouraged or prohibited for women, we might see the history of this kind of abusive control rooted in a kind of selfish desire, right? trying to keep the object of our infections submissive to us. Frightening, isn't it? Right? Plato nailed it a long time ago. Right? And we see this happen in relationships. I, I knew a girl in uh, my undergrad of university who was going back to university. Um, she, she was married and had a couple of kids with this guy. And this guy would become so upset that she was in university that he would steal her textbooks and hide them. Right? How many other people have been prevented from pursuing an education because of the fear of their beloved that they will develop some sort of independence. Right? So it's all about control. Right? Now in terms of the physical development, I'm not going to spend a long time on this, but nonetheless uh, the idea is that it's again the same principle is that you're not going to want anything that's going to resist you kind of thing so effectively um this is page 20. um uh, we can take up our next topic after drawing this to a head the sort of body a lover wants in his boy is one that will give confidence to the enemy in in, in a war or other great crisis while causing alarm to friends and even lovers, even though um, uh, enough on this point, the point is obvious. In terms of physical development, somebody with this kind of desire does not want somebody who can physically best him. Right? So effectively, right, in terms of intellectual strength and physical strength, you're going to want to be the superior of the object of your desire. So effectively, right, what winds up happening to the physical development of the beloved right, is similar to that which happens to the intellectual development. Right? Now, um, I'm going to read through this section on um, rate by 239e on your page 20. 
uh, with regard to possessions and then say a few words about it. Our next topic is uh, the benefit or harm your possessions uh, 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 to your possessions that will come from a lover's care and company. Everyone knows the answer, especially the lover. His first wish to, uh, will be for a boy who has lost his dearest, kindliest, and godliest uh, possessions, his mother and father, and other close relatives. He would be happy to see uh, the boy deprived of them, since he would expect them either to block him from his sweet uh, the sweet pleasure of the boy's company, or to criticize him severely for taking it. What's more, a lover would think uh, that any money or other wealth the boy owns would only make him harder to snare, once snared, harder to handle. It follows uh, by absolute necessity that wealth in a boyfriend will cause his lover to envy him while poverty will be a delight. Furthermore, he will wish for the boy to stay wifeless, childless, homeless as long as possible since that's how long his desire now, he desires to go on plucking his sweet fruit, right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So in terms of possessions, if you've got an object of your desire who is in some way financially or socially independent from you, it's more likely that they'll, they'll resist you, they'll develop a backbone, they might leave you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're ruled by this kind of desire, right, then you're going to make this beloved dependent on you. Right? This is why in so many marriages, when, um, it, it, for example, the wife, in a couple of cases that I can think of, comes into a bit of money, the husband insists on taking it over. Right? This is why... For generations, the husband, the breadwinner, handled all of, all of the money and gave the wife an allowance for groceries and that sort of thing, right? So it's it's sort of funny how that and and then on top of that, how many how many abusive relationships um, it actually start by isolating the person from their family, their friends. And whatnot. It seems like a strong argument. If love is this kind of desire, it's a form of madness, a passion that overcomes our better elements, an inborn desire for pleasure that overcomes all, what does it want? If this desire is present, it wants to be sated. Right. So what Plato does is uh, draws this uh, to conclusion on 22. Right. Yeah. Why not? Uh, 22 by 241c. Um, otherwise, it follows necessarily that he'd be giving himself to a man who is deceitful, irritable, Jealous, disgusting, harmful to his property, harmful to his physical fitness, absolutely devastating to the cultivation of his soul, which truly is and will always be the most valuable thing to gods and men. These are points that you should bear in mind, my boy. You should know that the, uh, the friendship of a lover arises without any good will at all. No, like food, its purpose is to sate hunger. Do wolves love lambs? That's how lovers befriend a boy. Right. So when somebody is overcome by this kind of desire, it's almost incidental in the well-being of the beloved. It's almost incidental. The lover simply wants to sate their desire, just like if I'm hungry, I want to sate that hunger. Do I have good will towards dinner? No. I eat dinner. I want dinner to say to my hunger. It's in the same vein that, according to this argument, this kind of love, this kind of erotic love, this kind of passionate love, 
right, wants to consume the beloved. Right? Plato argues there's no good will at all. And he kind of sums it up there, right? Um, it, do, 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 over on 23. Um, you didn't notice, my friend, that even though I'm criticizing the lover, I've passed beyond lyric, lyric into epic poetry. What do you suppose, uh, suppose will happen to me if I be, begin to praise its opposite? Don't you realize that the nymphs to whom you so clever, cleverly expose me would take complete possession of me? So I say instead, in a word, that every shortcoming which we blame the lover has its contrary advantage in the non, and the non-lover possesses it. Why make a long sp uh, speech of it? That's enough about them both. This is my story, uh, or, uh, th uh, this way my story will meet, in it, uh, meet the end it deserves and I will cross the river and leave before you make me do something even worse. All right. So effectively he said, okay, everything I just said about the lover, there are contrary advantages and the non-lover has them, etc., etc. Right. So he yada yada it over the, the tail end of this argument. Now. Unfortunately, for well, fortunately, because we get more dialogue and this is interesting stuff, um, <clears throat> it, this is not where it ends. Because effectively, what Socrates has done, right, the character Socrates, right, which Plato is still paying some heed to, he's still got a divine and familiar sign, a dame on, uh, talking in his head, he'll, he still proclaims his own ignorance, that sort of thing, right? even though we're going to see some weird arguments out of him. Um, you know, what Socrates has just done is critiqued Eros. Eros is one of the pantheon of the Greek gods. Uh -huh. So effectively, what Socrates did with the bag over his head, not wanting to, not really meaning it, is he just critiqued one of the gods. He's also confessed to us that the entire time he was speaking, his Socratic daemon, his divine and familiar sign, was screaming in his ear, Socrates, no, don't argue this. Right? So now he has to fix it. Right? This is not the conclusion that love is bad, uh, that he wants to wind up with. Right? So now what he has to do is construct another line of argument, and he will do so in Socrates' second speech, right? which he will consider um, what he calls on the bottom of 20, uh, 25 a palinode to love. Uh, before I'm punished uh, for uh, uh, speaking ill of him, uh, now with my head bare and no longer covered in shame. Right. So effectively, what Socrates needs to do is knock down this stronger argument that he has just made. Right. And he starts this palinode, um, <coughs> excuse me, on page 27. Right. Um, and uh, he does so this way. Um, remember, it's a deductive argument. If the premises are true, the conclusion necessarily follows. So you can't just say no -uh to the conclusion. You've got to question one of these two pre premises, either that love is madness or madness is bad. Right. And here's how he does it. It might be surprising to you. Right. 27. There's no truth to that story. Uh, that when a lover is available, you should give your favors to a man who doesn't love you instead, because he's not in control of himself, but the lover has lost his head. It's rhyming. Right. That would have been fine to say if madness were bad, pure and simple, but in fact, the best things we have come from madness when it's given as a gift from the god. So, it's going to be this premise uh, that he's going to call into question, meaning that this conclusion is also not necessarily the case. Right. So, this is um, the beginning of Socrates' second speech here. I'll just take you to the point where he knocks down um, this argument, and then we'll do a brief pause. I need some different notes up on the board, so you'll get a third video. All right. Um, he gives us three examples of madness that 
are not bad, but in fact, quite good. Right? These aren't too terribly important. I'll just go over them fairly quickly. Right? Um, they are prophetic madness. Now, we're not talking about Dionne Warwick and her psychic friends here or anything along those lines. I like to think of this as an intuition. You ever just get a bad feeling about something? There's nothing to really indicate that anything is amiss, nothing rational, nothing reflective, that sort of thing, but you just get a bad feeling. So you step away from a situation and it turns out that there was something there, right? Prophetic madness could be something as simple as intuition. Now, the ancients were serious about their prophecy, but I don't think in order to accept that prophetic madness is a beneficial kind of madness, I don't think we need to go as far as some sort of mystical poet, uh, 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 prophecy, right? but rather just realize that we're way more intuitive than we give ourselves credit for. It's not overtly rational, so insofar as it's not acquired judgment that leads through reasoning towards what is best, it's not called being in your right mind. But Nonetheless, it is a kind of intuition. You don't really have a reason, but nonetheless, right, you've got a strong feeling that leads you in one direction or in another, towards something or away from something. And when it works, it really works. Now, um, now I come from an Irish Catholic family, and uh, it's all of the women in my family are 100% psychic in hindsight. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. That might be a bad example, right? Good examples might be you just get some sort of intuitive kind of um, sense, right? And it leads you in a positive direction or away from a catastrophe. Uh, and you get a bad feeling about this, right? maybe on a first date or entering a business arrangement or, you know, just walking down a street at night or something along those lines. Right. The second kind of madness that he points out that is a good kind of madness, there's actually a lot of um, evidence to support this. This is why they give couples and divorces nerve bats, right? And um, stuff like that, or um, advise, you know, jumping up and down and screaming. Um, advise, uh, vacation, play, that sort of thing, right? When you're feeling overwhelmed, do you ever just ah, scream, right? You're just overwhelmed by all of the things that, it, or just jump up and down or do something crazy or, you know, in the middle of a stressful winter term, you go on spring break and just blow off some crazy steam or something like that, right? Well, that's catharsis. Cathartic madness, right? You go a little crazy, it doesn't really address any of your problems in some sort of reasoned, practical kind of way, but you feel better and you're more able to... It, it, Shakespeare was fond of cathartic madness. You gotta go a little bit crazy to regain your sanity kind of thing. You overcome your trouble. Uh, the blues is um, a good example of this, right? It's, I mean, to a certain extent, it's, it's the, the, the subject matter of blues songs. It's just wailing about horrible things that's happened, that have happened to your life, right? To your job, to your relationships, to your, your life generally, right? But you know, there's something cathartic insofar as you wail it and you feel better, right? So, cathartic madness, right? Um, and then finally, uh, third comes, uh, 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 third comes the kind of madness that is, uh, 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 that is um, possession by the muses, which takes a tender vein in the soul and awakens it in a bacchic frenzy of songs and poetry that glorifies the achievements of the past and teaches them to future generations. Think about it. If any of you are artists, writers, musicians, think about when you are inspired. 
I know, I know, as, as, as somebody who writes, I mean, half the time I spend just staring at the blinking cursor, trying to find the, infra, uh, the inspiration to actually get through this stuff. It's hard, it's hard to start, but when you're inspired, it's as though the thing writes itself. Or, you know, if you're a musician, you ever try to play when you're not really feeling it? But when you're feeling it, it's as though, I mean, people in sports experience being in the zone in the same kind of way. It might fall into the same vein as uh, being inspired by the muses, right? So it's, we call this poetic madness, right? So we have one, two, three examples of madness that are not necessarily bad. Uh, this takes us so far in terms of refuting this argument. This argument from Socrates is a strong argument. Love is a kind of desire. We have these two kinds of desires, acquired judgment and that which is inborn. One leads towards pleasure and the other seems to lead towards best. The kind of love that we're talking about that's bad is erotic love, um, which is when the inborn desire for pleasure overcomes your better elements and is driven to take pleasure in beautiful bodies. It's sexual, right? So this kind of love is a form of madness. Madness is necessarily bad. Therefore, love is necessarily bad, right? So that's the way this argument operates. Now, Socrates, the character, through Plato, the author, has come in and given us three examples of madness that aren't necessarily bad. He hasn't demonstrated that love is a form of madness that is not bad as well. He's just cast aspersions on this argument. He's made you skeptical about this argument. It's not as strong as it seems. Now what he has to do in Socrates' second speech, which is the third speech right, that we're taking a look at, the final one, is make a case for how love, in addition to the three kinds of madness that we've taken a look at, right, the cathartic, the poetic, and the prophetic kind of madness, these are good kinds of madness, but love is a fourth kind of madness, which is actually of benefit. Right? That's what he's got to argue next. And that's what the following video will address.